All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our multimodality conference, which today is going to be essentially and mostly an echo conference. And we're going to talk of a topic that is very dear to all of us in the echo lab because we manage it every single day. Um, as I mentioned in a previous talk, a lot of the echoes we do every day um, relate around the area of uh, evaluating left ventricular function. Can you, you can hear me well? I'm going to turn it around. Now. Okay. It's uh, along the lines of uh, assessing uh, LV function. And we talked a few weeks ago about the global assessment. Today, we're going to talk about the regional assessment, which is the other very important component of our evaluation that every day is done on, on every single patient. And I don't have to tell you that in essence, by convention, regional function has been um, classified as normal contraction, hypokinetic or depressed, akinetic when basically there's no contraction that can be uh, seen, dyskinetic when it's actually bulging out of the systole, and aneurysman, which is a frank, not just bulging, but a frank geometric distortion that is seen even in diastole. So there's a difference between an aneurysm and just plain dyskinesis, because with an aneurysm, you need to have a geometric distortion in diastole as well as systole. So as you will see this, uh, this study here, um, clearly the patient has a global dysfunction with an EF that actually, with the use of contrast, was able to be traced and calculated, and it came out to about 33%. And we talked about this the last time. We say 33%, it could be 35, 36, it could be 30. I mean, there is a plus or minus range with our methods that we have to be um, cognizant of, and of all methods. Um, all methods have a certain range with the numbers they provide. Um, certainly, uh, you all have seen data to suggest that uh, cardiac MRI may be the one that has the least variation and therefore the more reproducibility, but all techniques will have a certain amount of variation. Now, is this totally global or is there any regional dysfunction here? What do you all think? Yeah, so, so it looks like maybe here at the apex things are not doing much, and maybe here very distal septum. So we agree, there's some suggestion here. Now, could this be a non-ischemic myopathy? Yeah. Could this be a patient that has ischemic myopathy with the apex being worse than everything else? Yes. So um, the presence of regional wall motion abnormality, although it increases the statistical odds of CAD, is not a slam dunk. Likewise, the absence of regional wall motion do not exclude CAD. So uh, because of all the reasons that are well known to all of us. Now, we could argue that maybe this inferior base is not quite as good as the rest. Again, this is a more a soft point, and I mention that simply because um, this is going to be an area that we have probably the most difficulty uh, with the eye, the base of the inferior wall. And the reason is that even in normal people, this region tends to be a little bit less contractile than the rest. Same thing for the very base of the inferior septum uh, in the four chamber view. So, is this ischemia or previous infarction? In this particular example, I, I would not be sure. You know, I would suspect perhaps an apical infarct, but it would, it would not be sure. This one I would be more sure of, okay? So I hope in this one you all can see that um, there is good motion of the septum, lateral wall, even here the inferior septum, Short axis view, very helpful. Um, the, the, the older I get, the more I like short axis. Uh, as, as you know from the MRI world, they do pretty much a lot of the 
assessment just by doing multiple cuts of your accesses from base to apex. If we could always get rate cuts from base to apex, that probably would you know, be better than anything else because uh, you have the best use of ultrasound in terms of being able to have axial resolution that gives you a much better assessment of the, um, of the myocardium. You can all see that this area is not coming in as well. All these others are. And uh, here in the two chamber, very nicely, you can see that all of this is not contracting well. But we see something else. We see a lot of brightness in this myocardium right here. And that tends to go a lot more with the scar. So this one, I would feel very comfortable saying that there is a kinesis, maybe even a touch of this kinesis, of the inferior base, we have it here too, and that this is very likely an all infarct because of that brightness. So the more thinning of the endocardium that you see, you can see it's very, very thin here, although it does not 100% exclude infarction because as you know in the talks that uh, uh, Deepan has given in viability, they have had times when the wall gets thin and, and it's still viable. But they're small, they're very infrequent. So most of the time, a very thin wall tends to be more of a scar. And if on top of that, it has that uh, additional brightness in the subendocardium here, then you feel a lot more comfortable saying that this is probably an old infert. All right, you can see a little bit of that hypokinesis here in the infralateral wall. So this is the diagram. Uh, this diagram has been up dated in the last uh, six, seven years. Before, it was only a 16 segment, but uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the, all the imagers got together. So echo guys, cath guys, nuclear guys, CT guys, MRI guys, and they created a consensus, which the consensus basically was adopting the 16 segment diagram that ECHO had used, but adding the tip of the apex, because there are times that a patient only has a little tip of the apex that is akinetic. So it's now a 17 segment, but it's basically otherwise the same. The colors indicate the territories that you are all familiar with, and of course we know that this inferior inferolateral region is a little bit of a no man's land between RCA and CERC depending on the dominance of either vessel. And then the score, which is basically summing up what we say, well, how we score each of the um, segments and divided by 17. Now, we have been a little bit of revolutionary outliers uh, for the past 30 years. Uh, so, you know, mea culpa. Uh, we have not totally followed exactly uh, the classification that has been the standard because we adopted from the very beginning that we started doing echocardiography uh, when you guys were in uh, either uh, primary school or high school. Um, we adopted a mild hypokinesia as a distinction from hypokinesia because there were times that we felt that there were segments that were not contracting quite as well but they, they were not that bad either. So we created a two-gray distinction between a mild and a moderate, although we just simply say hypokinesis. Um, so other than that, we pretty much follow the, the scheme that has been recommended by the ASE and then more recently by the consortium of all the imaging modalities. Now, now we have speckle tracking. And, um, Speckle tracking has done uh, has been a good and a bad news. Um, the good news is that clearly it has shown to us that with speckle tracking we can detect areas of regional dysfunction that the eye doesn't quite pick up. That's the good news. The bad news is that there is no other gold standard to compare with. And at times then you have to decide whether you buy what you see in the speckle tracking or not. In other words, is it a real finding or is it an artifact of the technique? Because as we have discussed in other, in other talks, speckle tracking basically 
is a very sophisticated digital processing technique where you take the pixels, tiny, tiny pixels in the image, and the system can track the movement of that pixel throughout the cycle. And by doing that, if you take two pixels together and you track them, you can see how closer they go to each other between diastole and systole, and calculate then the percent shortening of those two pixels and even the rate of shortening. And if you do that through a bunch of pixels across, you get all of this information that we see here. So in this example, these little dots here indicate where these curves are being taken. And you can also now, with some of the newer techniques, you can do an average of the entire circumference of that particular view and then get one single average curve that comes here. So you can get these regional curves, you get these single curves, and then you get this color histogram, which if nothing else is kind of pretty, um, where you can start at the base of the inferior septum, for example, go through the apex and come back to the lateral wall. And using the colors, you basically what you're seeing is the, head, the symmetry of contraction of all these segments. Because you can see that the, the pinks become orange, red, and then comes back to pink, saying that everything is sort of coming together relatively in a symmetric way. And if there's a lot of uh, the synergy, this color map just or a histogram just goes, you know, becomes very, very funny looking. Uh, but the curves will show you the same thing. So there are just multiple ways of expressing. If this is 100% accurate, if you could always trust this, then you, we, we have here a tool that is really way, way beyond the eye. Problem is, since we don't have any other way of confirming, sometimes we wrestle with, is this real or not? Patient like this, it's no problem. The eye tells you this is a lousy ventricle. Even the eye tells you that there's some synergy, And then now this confirms it. You can see the color being very, very abnormal. Now we have a curve here that is in the going in the, in the right direction. Depressed values, but still moving in the right direction. So this will be hypokinetic segments. This will be more severely hypokinetic. And then here you have a segment going the, the wrong way. So this will be sort of a dyskinetic segment. Or the synchronous segment. You know, I, now we have... With, the, with this now, the question is, is this dyskinesis from ischemia or dyssynchrony from uh, electrical issues? But this is very sophisticated, no question about it. Uh, and in fact, um, reports have been published in the literature, were even addressed with in an in a image that the eye appears to look normal. Uh, you can see curves where there are abnormalities in areas that are supplied by vessels that subsequently, when they uh, cast the patient, uh, the patient has a lesion. So in this case, it happens to be a circumflex lesion with these inferoposterior segments having these curves here. And in fact, um, this was a study where uh, they did basically a very sophisticated uh, study by occluding the vessels. Um, and of course, every time you guys go to the cath lab and do a percutaneous coronary intervention, you are occluding the, the patient. So it's, it was an easy study. Patients were going through their uh, PTCA or, or uh, interventional procedure, and they were recording images throughout, showing very nicely that the systolic strain was re re reduced in those uh, areas uh, that were affected by the um, by the ischemia, and here's the time of defle the deflation. And you can actually document stoning uh, and, and so on. So very sophisticated. This has been done in animals first, shown that it was working very nicely. And then this was a nice study because they actually did it in patients. So at rest, most of the time, we depend on the eye. Now we are asking our sonographers to do more and more of these strain curves. And those of you who have read me with me in the lab, you can see, you know that sometimes we buy them and sometimes we kind of don't buy them because we're not sure. Um, so it's, it's work in progress. Uh, right now we're using a little more the global strain values than the original ones because of the potential value that they may have in detecting uh, early phases of uh, cardiac dysfunction, like in patients receiving chemotherapy. And um, 
Clearly, there are times when we have patients, for example, with lead bundles, patients with concentric LVH, where we clearly see uh, regional dysfunction by strain that the eye does not see, and we buy it. We, we, we believe that it's probably a real finding. And then there are other times when the image is quite not that pristine, the, you know, the quality of the pictures are not that good, and when then we get these funny looking curves, and if the eye does not uh, pick up anything, I, I'm, right now I'm still more inclined to let it roll. Because the problem is that if you make a call in a, in a ventricle that by eye looks normal, if you're making a call that there is a subclinical regional dysfunction, uh, I mean, that has some real implications for that patient. When that report goes back to that doctor, what would the doctor do with that report? Is the doctor going to cut the patient? What is he going to do? So I think we're going to need some kind of prospective study to help us decipher a little better whether we can accept these findings that are not clearly documented by the eye or not. And I think that still uh, has to be done great potential for any of you guys that want to do uh, research in ECHO because I think it's one of the areas that everybody's struggling with. Uh, not sure exactly whether we make a call or not when we see this regional dysfunction by, by strain and the eye cannot uh, distinguish it. So let's take it now to stress echo, all right? So does any, this is a 62 guy with chest pain. Anybody sees anything here abnormal by eye? <coughs> okay, good, because I don't either. All right. Now, what about here? Do you see anything of anything unusual here? Rob, what do you think? Looks like the anterior anterior and lateral walls. Uh, First of all, what do you think of the uh, ear? Uh, looks maybe a little bit more depressed, maybe. What would you say if I show you this as a resting echo? If I say you know, this is one of 70 resting echoes we did today. How would you read that if this were a resting echo? Uh, probably like hypokinesis or hypokinesis in the LED distribution. Okay. Everybody agrees? Anybody will have anything different? I, I will tell you later how I will read it. Anyone else wants to have any other thoughts? I can tell you, if, if, I were, if this were a resting echo, I would read this as a borderline, low EF, maybe 50, maybe 48, somewhere in that 48 to 51. We have a bunch of those every day, right? To me, everything is kind of somewhat depressed. I would be a little bit more concerned maybe with this region here, but I would be, con you know, this would be, I would say, I would have said diffuse mild hypokinesis everywhere, and then maybe made a little bit more, hypo more hypokinesis here. And we see a lot of resting echoes that look like this, don't we? A lot of them. And the reason why I showed this is because when you're seeing a resting echo like this, is this baseline function for that patient? Is that patient under undergoing some ischemia at the time of the echo, of the resting echo? Is this a hibernating ventricle? Is this just a guy who's septic? Is this a guy that has a mild cardiomyopathy? Is this a blah, 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 blah? In other words, you don't know, okay? So the reason I did this on purpose is because when you do a stress echo and then you put them side by side, that's a whole different ballgame, okay? So when you do the stress echo, now what you have done, if you have taken that first image that we saw at rest, put it right next to the post-stress image, and now I think hopefully most of you would say, wow, there's a problem here. Look how, how symmetric contraction is, how the end systolic cavity is nice and small versus the end systolic cavity here, same way in the short axis. That's your end systolic cavity versus that one. And when I'm looking at stress echoes, I always look at the size of the ventricle at end systole. That's one of the first things my eye goes to. The second thing my eyes goes to is the regional end systolic diameters. Because as you all know, the ventricle should get smaller at end systole and in diastole also. 
as you go from base to apex, but particularly an N-systole. So it should have a bigger diameter here, a little smaller, a little smaller, and very small out here. So my eyes quickly look at that because we are very good at looking at relative changes, and I can quickly see that there is something wrong with the geometry of a heart when I see a side-by-side -side comparison of a resting with stress. So that as we look at this one, clearly that's not only a bigger cavity at a systole, but the diameters are actually bigger. And in fact, right here, the end systolic diameter is actually bigger than here, right? Where here, it was not. Here, it was absolutely perfectly normal. So without even looking at regional thickening of the segments, my eye already is telling me there's something wrong here by just simply accentuating end systolic cavity size and end systolic diameter sizes, okay? So yeah, this is a very positive stress echo in a patient that obviously has multi-vessel disease. And we can see it in all of the views, including the apical views. Compare that end systolic cavity with that end systolic cavity somewhere here. So this is a left main, a multi-vessel disease. This is obviously quite significant ischemia. And this was a treadmill stress echo. And this is the slide that you have seen a hundred times that as ischemia occurs, the very first thing that happens is just a difference in flow, flow heterogeneity. In theory, in theory, with nuclear techniques, you should be able to detect this even before you get any abnormalities of function, in theory. Because if you're simply looking at flow heterogeneity, you should be able to see this, you know, and actually PET scanning is supposed to be based on that concept so that they can pick up flow heterogeneity even before uh, regional dysfunction. Now, when ischemia occurs, then regional dysfunction is very, very quick, very quick to happen. Particularly in diastole first, but, but it's, we're talking seconds between diastole and systole. Um, and then, of course, you may or may not get EKG and you may or may not get the, the angina. So, um, ischemia during stress is transient, reversible, involve both systole and diastole, but how long, how, you know, how soon does it take to reverse? And again, studies in the animal lab showed that even if you occlude an LAD for two minutes, it might take you 10, 15 to recover. So a very brief episode of ischemia can still have some stunning that prolongs for five, 10 minutes. And that is the basis for the treadmill stress echo, okay? So this function may last minutes or hours depending on the magnitude of the stunning phenomenon. In a typical stress, stress test, you're basically going to have ischemia for maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. But that may be enough to have a little bit of stunning for enough minutes so that the patient can get off the treadmill, lay down, and you still can see it. We still work very hard at capturing your pictures within um, a minute and a half, hopefully within 60 seconds, but we try not to go beyond 90 seconds after the patient stops on the treadmill. Uh, because we're always concerned that if the ischemia was not that severe, it might recover too quickly. And of course, we stress patients with these techniques that you all are very familiar with, so I won't spend too much time here. The only thing I will, I will mention is that um, in some places, we, and we probably perhaps should be doing it at times, they will enhance endovitamin stress by either giving, well, we give atropine all the time, but, but also by doing an even hand grip. Atropine obviously uh, has become the the preferred way of getting that heart rate up to the 85% uh, predicted max. Hand grip ha has helped at times, and there's been some publications showing that if you make the patient squeeze for uh, 30 seconds or 40 seconds, you can enhance, uh, detect a little bit more ischemia. Um, so we do treadmills, we do a lot of them, and the main advantage is that it's very standard. Everybody has a treadmill machine, blues protocols, we know them well. We get additional information, very helpful. The ST changes, the exercise capacity with, that we can all put in a, in a model to predict the risk. Everybody has it, but it's limited because it is actually the most difficult of all the stress tests for the, for the sonographer. It's very intensive. Um, 
They have to work very fast after the patient comes back into the stretcher. And the biggest ha problem is that by memory, because there's nothing there in the, in the, in the um, uh, monitor to help the sonographer, the sonographer has to try to reproduce the same imaging planes that were seen at rest in a chest that, as you know, varies in every patient. And they try to get that parastellar long axis to be as close as possible to the one that was done at rest and the short axis and the apicals. And that can be challenging at times. So it's, this is the most difficult of, of the three stress techniques. My ischemia could recover before you catch the images, particular, particularly if you struggled and took you a little longer than, than a minute to get them. And then you only have a rest and a post exercise. That's very important, not when you have resting dysfunction. So a patient that has a resting bad ventricle, unless you really want to know exercise capacity in a treadmill well, and that's actually for you more important than the images, that patient should not have a treadmill stress test, stress echo, okay? Because when you have resting dysfunction, what you're trying to, to know is, is that ventricle that has an EF of 30% gets better with a little bit of exercise and then gets worse with ischemia? But if you're going to only have two images to look at, you have nothing in between. So it could look equally bad, <laughs> rest and stress. You have no idea what happened in between, okay? So when you have a bad ventricle, exercise treadmill stress echo is not a good test unless unless for you is a side benefit and what you are really wanting to know is their exercise tolerance on a treadmill, you know. So um, that's, that's an important take home message. And we have done studies in the early days when the techniques were being developed where we had uh, about 289 patients, all of them with the same treadmill test, with the same stress, they had the echo and the nuclear. So one stress, two imaging modalities, showing a very nice concordance. And interesting, the discordances were equally matched. Most of these 17 patients that had an abnormal echo, they had a normal uh, nuclear, but they had CAD, and equally here. So it was both were equal in screwing up uh, one way or the other, whether it was specificity or sensitivity, but there was no Necessary, necessary prep, uh, uh, one of them, one uh, ahead of the other. Uh, this was another important paper that has been, that has been um, uh, referred to many, many times because it was a meta-analysis that uh, included uh, something like 3,500 patients. And uh, again, showed that stress echo and nuclear came out very well in sensitivity, but specificity was superior in the echo world than the nuclear. However, this is academic laboratories with expertise in both. The truth of the matter is that when you take stress echo to the street, um, the specificity drops. And I think at the level of community practices, probably both share a specificity in the 60s. That's reality for both. That's what we see frequently when we get patients referred and whatnot. Sensitivities hold uh, reasonably for both. Now, the, the other advantage, as I mentioned, of, uh, of a treadmill is that you get the Duke treadmill score. So you throw that into the equation together with your imaging, which, as you know, includes the amount of time in the, excess in the uh, treadmill, whether there is ST uh, depression, and whether they have any chest pain. So you throw all that into a score that can be very helpful. And many years ago, uh, in a study that we did, we showed very nicely that if you own it, that if you use all of it, if you made use of the imaging using the wall motion score at exercise as your marker, the ST depression and the duration of treadmill, you could create this three dimensional scale and have recognized people that have very, very high risk of events in a short time. So no question about it that one big advantage of your treadmill is that you do get that extra stuff. You don't get that with the butamine. You don't get that with the adenosine nuclear. Same thing happens in, in the nuclear world. It's preferable to do an exercise nuclear than a uh, regular adenosine if the patient can exercise for the same reasons. And again, in a subsequent study, 
with uh, 248 patients, we showed that we could predict the risk <coughs> of events very nicely, equally with both techniques. And then there's bicycle. Bicycle is actually pretty nice because now you can, with these tables that we have where the patient can be inclined so it's easier to get imaging, you can follow the response to exercise. So now you have low exercise, moderate, and peak exercise. So now this is like a dobutamine. Now you can say it got better, it may have gotten worse. So now you can track. So therefore, if you do have a depressed ventricle and the patient can exercise, a bike would be better than a treadmill because you can see your intermediate stages and document that the heart maybe got a little better with low exercise and then went, went down with big exercise. So you have a better assessment of the depressed ventricle if you're con trying to look for viability, ischemia, and whatnot. So a bike may have as same value as dobutamine if the patient can exercise. And of course, you get the other benefits of uh, exercise tolerance, dyspnea, yes or no, and even throwing a little bit of Doppler, you can do uh, pinning pressures and, uh, and PA pressures. And this is for the sonographers in the room. Do not forget, if for any reason at peak exercises, the imaging becomes hard because maybe the patient is puffing and moving and, and breathing too hard, that's okay. Stop exercising and within a few seconds, you are in a post-exercise mode. The advantage is it may take you 10 seconds to get the images rather than having to wait for the patient to come off a treadmill, walk to a stretcher, lay down on a stretcher, and then you start imaging. So the bike has that other advantage that if at peak exercise the quality of the images are not great, within a very quick time you have a post-exercise. And now the stunning phenomenon is less of a problem because, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you really have to be incredibly mild ischemia to, to recover in 10 seconds. So you have that extra benefit with the bike. <coughs> and this was a fellow that uh, had a bike. This guy was kind of interesting because this guy had had a nuclear stress test and it was totally normal. And the guy was a jogger and uh, he kept complaining that he was not doing as well uh, in his fourth mile of jogging. You know, I don't think I can jog four miles. But in his fourth mile of jogging, he was getting short of breath, which before he didn't. So he, gets, he has a nuclear done by his private cardiologist, which is normal, and he's told to, if you're getting old, just slow down. Um, he wasn't happy, so he came over for a second opinion, and we put him on a bike. And uh, anybody here sees anything? A pick up? Hmm? Really? Is that all you see? Follow my rules. Look at the end systolic cavity size and look at the regional diameters at end systolic. And compare, I like to compare, by the way, the, this stage, because this is a low work, this is low level of exercise, so you already have some catecholamines. If you can see here, the EF is a little better than here, because you already are enhancing with some catecholamines. So I usually do this. I tend to do this more often than this, okay? Because a heart may get better and may get worse, and this may, may, may not look that different from this, but it may look very different from here. So personally, when I'm doing dobutamines or um, bikes, I compare the lower level with the peak, because those are where you have your mass, more dramatic changes. And so what do you think of this end systolic cavity here versus that end systolic cavity here? No, you don't think anything? No, it's, uh, it's getting closer at the, at the 25 spot. But it's bigger at the peak. It's not moving as much at the peak. Yeah. I had to catch it on the right time. Yeah. There. So clearly bigger. And again, if you watch, if you look at the N-systolic diameters all the way through here, clearly bigger. Perhaps the only time when it gets closer to baseline is right about here. So, 
And again, you can see the same thing here, because this one's still at 50 watts, he's still doing pretty well. So what, if this is the area affected, what vessel would be the most likely? Excuse me? Thirk. Yeah, Thirk. Uh, of two marginal and whatnot. Yeah. And that's what he had. He had significant disease in his Thirk. Okay. So, so years ago, we did this study where the same patients had both, the treadmill and the bike. And what we saw was that on the bicycle, the peak heart rate was less than the uh, treadmill, but the blood pressure was so much higher in the bike that the double products were identical. Um, and then overall, we had very good results uh, with a little bit better detection of one vessel, two vessels, but in essence, very similar results across the board. Perhaps a little bit more sensitive, although statistically that could not be proven. Um, so when we do a stress echo by bike, that's another take home message. We could care less about the heart rate. Okay, because 99.9% .9 of your bikes are not going to reach 85%. Forget it. What you're looking is for reaching 22K of double product. So if you have reached 22K of double product, you had a successful uh, exercise bike. So it's the, it's the study blood pressure times heart rate, what we use for a bike. And that's, they're very similar in the treadmill and in the bikes. The difference is on the treadmill, you get that $10 product by having a higher heart rate and a lower blood pressure. On the bike, it's a higher blood pressure and a lower heart rate. So it's double product, not heart rate, when we do a bike. Because otherwise, you'll be, every report of a bike will be saying, patient, they don't reach. No, they never do. They never reach. Okay, then we get to dobutamine, and these are two separate examples. And both shows the good and the bad of the video. Okay? So the good is easy. This is your easiest stress echo for a sonographer who is beginning to get used to stress echo. Nice and comfortable, patient is lying there, you get your images, and you get nice pictures, you know, and so on. That's the good. The bad is that frequently hearts become so hyperdynamic that they get to become so small <coughs> that it can be very, very hard when you have a tiny, tiny heart contracting in a very small cavity to detect abnormalities. And this is worst in people with concentric LVH. And the lowest sensitivity is in those folks. I hate to see a dobutamine stress echo in a hypertensive patient that have LVH because we, I know we could very well me, be missing significant disease and we have, and I have, we have anecdotes of that disease where patients do not do well later, and they have a perfectly normal dobutamine echo. Now, um, obviously, there are also examples of abnormality, otherwise the test would not have reached the popularity that it did. This is a nice example where you can see everything looking good at rest. Again, notice between resting and um, 10 mics, nice improvement, and systolic cavity is smaller. Everything is moving nice. So in dobutamines, I frequently do 10 versus peak for my eye, okay? Particularly if you have an abnorm a, a bad ventricle at rest. Because if you have a bad ventricle at rest, the peak may look just as bad as the rest. But this one here may look really good or much better. So I, I tend to do a comparison this way. And you can see again, this heart is getting bigger in systolic. Diameters are bigger in the apical segments versus the basilar segments, when in fact it should be the opposite. And we see that in the four chamber, and we see that in the two chamber. So all of this is abnormal. All of this is abnormal. The apex is not doing well. And of course, this is somebody that has big time LAD and maybe a third component, although a very proximal LAD could do a lot of this too. So we talked already about the fact that we can do multiple stages with the dobutamine as well as the bike. Uh, we could time ischemia in multiple territories because maybe one happens a little early and another one a little later. Same thing for the bike. These are common to the bike and the dobutamine. Easiest to learn, no question about it. Best for patients with low EF, no question about it. When we do viability studies, all of our 
viability research was done with dobutamine. And it's less sensitive than exercise across the board. Across the board, it is less sensitive than exercise. That's why it bothers me sometimes when we get patients from the chest pain unit that are totally mobile. And some idiot hospitalists ask for uh, dobutamine stress because the sensitivity is less. You know, you should always put a patient in a, in a treadmill or a bike if they can exercise. It's less sensitive across the board, worse with LVH, concentric LVH. Um, high incidence of arrhythmia, of course, that's the price you pay. More PVCs, more SVTs, more AFib. Uh, no data on capacity. I mean, you have no nothing about the capacity of the patient. Same thing that happens with a regadenosome nuclear. And the EKG is worthless. Rarely ever do you see a, a positive EKG with dobutamine, or with regadenosome. All the pharmacology stresses a very low detection of ischemia by EKG. Not zero, but low. So um, bottom line, we should exercise and defer dobutamine for those who cannot exercise, post MI assessment, which we rarely do, preoperative risk assessment, simply because a lot of these patients are going for big surgeries. If they're going for big surgery, they frequently cannot exercise. It's just part of the territory. It's not anything magic about it. It's just simply that if you're going for a big aneurysm of the abdomen or something like that, you already are somewhat limited. So most of the literature for pre-op risk is with dobutamine. And of course, the biggest win for dobutamine is in people with body hair. That's where the test does the best. All of these tests are appropriate. You can see that most of the scenarios that we can list, they're all appropriate. The inappropriate ones are Somebody that has a very low pretest probability and has a perfectly good looking EKG and can exercise. And now insurance companies are getting on this and they're denying performing a stress echo or a stress nuclear in these kind of patients. And the other one that is not appropriate is the opposite. If you have somebody that at rest is having a lot of chest pain, they have a big time probability and already the EKG is abnormal with either elevation, depression, or you know, stable angina, you're not going to be stressing the guy. You're, you know, you're going to do something else. But most of all the, all the other clinical scenarios uh, are appropriate, uh, very similar. This is almost identical to uh, nuclear techniques. Um, so our limitations, of course, is that we are doing everything with the eye. And, and we went through a few examples. And maybe you saw what I was pointing out, and maybe you didn't see it, because it's, you're trying to educate your eye to do this. Uh, it requires a lot of skills from the sonographers. And clearly, there is the issue of experience versus non-experience centers or observers when uh, doing this type, of, this type of testing. So again, this is where the strain could come back. And actually, I would love to see us get involved in a well-done study where we can try to see whether we can truly improve the strain. Because you know, you, once you have this, you don't need to be an echocardiographer, right? Anybody, look at this, eh? OK, that's abnormal. That looks like uh, RCA, maybe a dominant RCA. That looks like a CERC, you know. That looks like a big time LID with maybe a tiny little bit of an RCA. I mean, once you have that, you don't need to be an echocardiographer. The question is, can we trust this? Can we, on a day-to-day -day basis, get images that can allow us to do this? Because if we could, it would be phenomenal, you know, really. Yeah, it eliminates the issue of uh, observer experience or anything. Problem is, how accurate is it in a day-to-day -day basis? I would love to see us do a study like that because we have everything here. We have the tools, we have the machines, we have good sonographers and patients that get cut. Now, the studies have been done and they have shown that actually in a center that has the expertise to do the, uh, the techniques, that they fare pretty well with the eye. And uh, this is a more recent study uh, of about close to 100 patients. They all had CA, and clearly they could see that the non-ischemic patients had an improvement in strain, and then recovered after uh, afterwards, and ischemic had much less. And then they, using their baseline information from the normal controls, they use a, a a change of less than minus 20% as an indicator of abnormality, and they ended up with a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 87%, which got better when they incorporate the eye. But to me, that's kind of like, okay, you do one or the other. <laughs> uh, 
But anyway, at any rate, in a, in a control group of 100 people, they all had a car, um, excellent center with the expertise, they could show that it's doable. The question is, is this doable in a day-to-day -day basis with all comers, people uh, coming with all different sizes and whatnot? So clearly stress echo is a very good imaging technique with relatively low expense. And uh, actually, a lot of insurance companies now are asking, if you're asking for a nuclear, they say, have you done a stress echo? And they actually push you to do a stress echo before you do the nuclear. Because they know it's cheaper for them to do a stress echo than a nuclear. Um, but it's very dependent on skills of sonographers, observers, and whatnot. Um, to compete well with SPECT, um, uh, what is this? Oh, we compete constantly. Yeah, that's just what we did. Strain could be a solution, but I think the issue that I just mentioned before uh, needs to be addressed. So we have a few minutes to look at a few cases uh, and kind of review the eye. So, uh, Josh, what do you think of this case? Uh, start with the resting echo. Look at this quadrant and that quadrant, which are both resting. What do you think this patient has? Uh, normally, uh, it has a lot of LVH, concentric LVH. Right. So, I mean, it looks like he augments, again, lower specificity because of the LVH. Yeah, so this lady is 52. She clearly has very severe hypertrophy. We could argue whether it is asymmetric or concentric. I think it was a lot more asymmetric. Look at the chunk of septum here versus the wall here. I think there's a lot more, more myocardium right here than down here. So probably this is somebody that has Holcomb. They have Holcomb. He had hypertrophy, non-obstructive. There was no SAM, as you can see here. There's no SAM. So this probably is a non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In fact, this was a lady I took care of, and she did have a family history <coughs> of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She had recent pulmonary edema, OK? And this was a dobutamine stress. So she starts with a chunk of muscle, hyperdynamic heart at rest, and becomes, lo and behold, more hyperdynamic. Cavity obliteration. I mean, tiny little cavity left here. And there's your apical. You see anything? Now we're beginning to say, well, maybe, right? And also maybe, if you look at this area here, how small it is, here maybe. Again, now we get into the, all the maybes. And of course, we're biased because this patient was in pulmonary edema, so you know, we're looking, looking for something abnormal. And of course, and your eye becomes biased. You show this to somebody with no history, say, okay, tell me about that. You, you probably, patient, you probably they will say, oh, I don't see anything, which is, <coughs> So this lady uh, ultimately did get cut, and uh, she had an 80% mid LAD and an 80% circuit. Okay. So in other words, we did not believe this, this study. It had been ordered by a hospitalist, and we, we, you know, it was done. But then one, once we, we were consulted and we reviewed it, and said, uh-uh, one her cut. Sure enough, she had disease. You know. But this is a nice example of what I said before. Concentric LVH, it's a problem. It's a problem. I, we should almost refuse to do them, to be honest with you. Because it's a cost, there's some risk of AFib, and at the end we may not. It's only good if it's 4 plus positive, or otherwise very, oft we, very often we end up with these kind of things. Um, what about this one? What do you guys think about this one? Rest, 25 watts, 50 watts peak. This is a uh, bicycle. Is there anything funny with this story? Do you all accept this as being an okay story, or do you are you bothered by anything here? 
This one needs someone more experienced, so we're going to ask Rob to take a peek at that one. He, you know, he's already passed the exam, so. <laughs> so if you just look at the rest of the peak, you would say that it gets better to me, although you don't, you don't really see that uh, wall very well. Um, but I think that the 50 looks larger than the 25. <coughs> I think that the 50 looks larger than the peak, which also looks larger than the 25. So it's kind of a little suspicious. Okay, so what's the mitral valve? Here, there, uh, there, and there. Yeah. So this is basically a technical screw up. Um, in some patients that have very big T waves, the system can get confused and the capture occur not at the QRS or at the R, but at the T wave. So this was all diastole. The first frame is in systole, and then you see diastole. Where here, the first frame is in diastole, and, and it goes towards systole. Okay. Now, it may still be a normal stress test, but obviously now we have a real problem in, in technique. What about this one? Here's your resting study. Obviously, we know that these images are not great, but this is the resting study. Uh, this is uh, low level, higher level, and presumably the peak. <coughs> so it looks like we're going into cavity obliteration and then becoming big. But we have talked about this before, right? This is the other, if, if, if in a resting echo, for shortening can create problems, and we cover that extensively when we talk about global function, just imagine when you are in the heat of the battle with a stress echo. So for shortening is an Achilles tendon for stress echo as well as it is for rest, you know? And if you are in a hurry trying to get those images, and you end up for shortening. This looks like a cavity obliteration here, all because of foreshortening. So this is basically bad data. And you know, we 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 we've talked about that at length. Okay. So what do we see here? So this is again a dobutomy, five, I think it's ten and peak. Yep. Initial improvement and Contractility followed by some worsening. worsening. Yeah. Notice if you look at this and this, they look about the same. Look at that. Okay? If you look at that, very different. Even here, very different. So again, it's to emphasize the importance of um, multiple stages. And sometimes with a tread with a in the treadmill you don't have that advantage of multiple stages. So this heart has a little bit of mild depression at rest actually responds nicely and then and then worsens, okay? So the other thing I wanted to mention is you're doing a functional test. When the heart function drops during the stress, most of the time is CAD because of ischemia. But there are times that it can be because of uh, a severe increase in blood pressure and afterload, okay? And, and we have to, again, put everything together in some cases to, to understand which is which. And we have page examples of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that were with a blood pressure that went to 220 or 110 or something, and they, dro they just fell apart because of the afterload. So this is function, and function is most of the time related to perfusion, but it can also be affected by afterload. Okay, I think this is probably as good a time to stop because I do have to go to a meeting at one o'clock. So I hope this helps you on our day-to-day. -day, um, uh, and I tell you, the biggest uh, take-home message is concentrate on geometry and look at end systolic cavity size and regional shape and diameters. Train your eye to do that. And then after you do that and you get a sense for what's going on there, 
then take each segment and then look at their actual thickening and whatnot. But that first look at the cavity can be extremely helpful in, uh, in reading the studies. Do we have one next?